welcome everybody to worship online at Irondequoit Presbyterian. Glad you're with us today. Hard to believe it's already June, but here we are. I do have an announcement just to remind you of our Donate, Dine, and Sunday Drive event on Sunday, June 14th, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. here at church. So you'll pick up a to-go meal that you'll pre-order and pre-pay for with tasteful connections. And when you come to pick up your meal, you'll also bring your donations for Cameron Community Ministries so that we can support them in their work. And we'll, we'll sort of get to see each other as we drive by and drop things off and pick things up. But I hope you'll join us, get a wonderful meal, and again, support one of our mission partners. Well, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Let us begin with the prelude. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 8. 
O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, you built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. Would you join us together by their teaching, so that we may be a holy temple in whom your spirit dwells, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for the signs and for the seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged creature every winged bird of every kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every, every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, 
and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God, rest, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Our next lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, starting with verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Lord has always sought to work with us and through us. But why? Let's consider that today. The Great Commission, which we just heard in our lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, is the oft-quoted charge that Jesus gave to the disciples and to the church. This was their and our general directive for the work that we are to carry out as the Church of Jesus Christ. Jesus entrusted this mission to us to carry it out after he ascended into heaven. And we are entrusted with that work still today in his absence. Again, the Great Commission is, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And that's the basic kernel of it. Now thinking about it, it seems like Jesus entrusted us with a whole lot of responsibility. It's a tall order. Although, don't forget what we talked about last week, where we learned about how the Holy Spirit equips us in powerful ways for God's purposes. In any case, Jesus certainly put a lot of trust in us by giving us this commission. And yet, it is not the first time that God gave us, as human beings, an important job to do. We can go all the way back to the beginning, the very beginning, to the Genesis 1 account of creation where it begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then follows this poetry of the six days of creation where God spoke and things came into being. So let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so. Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. God spoke, and the sea creatures, the birds, the cattle, the creeping things, the wild animals, and humankind came into being. God created it, created all of it simply by speaking. And God didn't need any help. God did it all. Everything was in its place. God gave the earth its rhythm of day and night and the seasons. It had its balance all set by God. And together, 
It was very good. It strikes me, though, as very efficient, which I admit is a strange way to describe the creation of all things by God. But I say this because God does something very interesting on day six. God pays special attention to human beings by giving them a charge, a task. So verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God made this wonderful universe, ordered, balanced, very good, and then handed it off to the care of it to human beings. A pessimist might wonder why God would do such a thing because we as humanity are not perfect. Far from it. We're also not as powerful as God. We can't create things simply by a word. We aren't as efficient. Seems like a foolish move. And yet God entrusted creation, each other, to our care. It's a fascinating choice on God's part. Seemingly unwise if the hope was that everything would stay very good. But that's what God chose to do. That's the way it is. Now in verse 28, God instructed human beings to subdue and have dominion over creation. Now that could give the connotation of subjugate or conquer or use the earth however we please. But in verse 26... Just before God decided to give us this dominion over all the animals, God said, let us make humankind in our image. So this is where we get the idea that we're created in the image of God. But it's after that, God decided we ought to have dominion or rule. So folks who have really studied this Genesis 1 account point out that these two happenings, these two ideas have to go together. So, if we're created in the image of God, and the Lord who created all things then entrusts the world into our hands, and again, we're supposed to bear the image of God, then we are meant to exercise rule over all things in the way that God exercises dominion or rule. It has to be done in God's image. So just generally thinking, God created things to flourish. God is loving, compassionate, just, holy, righteous. That is how God rules. Therefore, being bearers of the image of God might mean that we are to emulate these characteristics of God in our lives as stewards of the earth and carers of each other. That is a tall order, to emulate God. Because finding the balance between utilizing the resources from the earth that we need to live and yet not destroying and consuming everything so that there's enough for everybody in future generations is a very difficult and complex and nuanced endeavor subject to great and heated discussion. And yet God gave us this job from the beginning. But couldn't God just take care of it all? It'd be so much easier. But God chose to work with and through us. Why? Well, I don't know the definite answer, but I can speculate, whatever it's worth. I suspect that God has always wanted us to be able to learn and grow. When we have the responsibility of making choices and mistakes, and we get the opportunity to create, to try to lead, to try to bring people together, to love, to be hurt, to care, to lose our patience, to be disappointed, to achieve something. We can learn and grow through those things. When we share in responsibility with God, through our experience of doing God's work with God, our ability to love one another and God can grow. Our relationship with God can grow stronger because we get a sense of what God is doing in this world. We learn to love as God does. So yes, for the Lord to charge us with the care of all things and people that God made is 
inefficient from the standpoint of getting things done quickly or keeping things nice and neat. But to be able to know God better and God's love by working alongside God, however imperfect we are, is far better, I think, than a reality where we're just robots with no thought or feeling, where God does everything, where there is no opportunity to learn and grow. Through experience, I believe that God continues and has always taught me things. I remember this one night during a season in my life when I was training as a chaplain. I was the designated night chaplain in the hospital for that night. And the on-call chaplain, as they called it, would respond to any variety of spiritual needs that patients or families or staff might have. Now this one night, started off with a mom asking for someone to say a prayer with her and for her newly born child. Just a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing for the newborn. As a chaplain, these were wonderful calls to get. I was happy to go and pray with the family who were filled with joy and thanksgiving and who would walk away from that hospital with a bigger family. But that was just the beginning of the shift. As the night wore on, in another part of the hospital, there was great sorrow because someone else's loved one had passed away. At one patient's bedside were her family and a good friend. They had gathered around her and had been with her as she passed away, and they sat in grief. But I remember this person's good friend sitting there and remarking how she cherished their friendship what a gift it was that they had been friends for 35 years, and she said, we never exchanged a crossword. She walked out of that hospital having lost something. It is a night that I will never forget to see the beginning of life and the end of it all in the span of a couple hours. One night was experienced so differently by two families. But through that night, I think I caught a glimpse, a snapshot of the breadth of God's love for us. Because God was in a lot of places that night with the new mom and her baby. And God was with the grieving friends and family. God was busy, present with each of them. And you know who else was there? People taking care of them. Nurses, aides, doctors, technicians, a myriad of other staff, they who had followed the call to care for God's people as medical professionals, cared for them alongside of God, even if they didn't know it. And I was the night chaplain that night, bumbling and dumbstruck by the gravity of all that had happened. But I got to see it all. I think God had a lesson in there for me through an experience I shall never forget. To see God's love at work through God's presence and through God's people who God had called. God, the creator of the universe, who can bring reality into being by word alone, chooses to work through us, mortal and imperfect beings. Not the most efficient, and yet that is the way it has always been. The Genesis 1 account of creation presents a challenge, I think, to remember that we, today, are still called to work with God so that we can grow to understand God's love, to know God better, and to increase our capacity to love because we are created in the image of God. So when we see the needs of the world, may we see an invitation from God to all of God's people to learn to love as God does. God has invited us to that work from the very beginning of time. Now we as individuals can't meet all and every need of the world, but with God and all of us answering God's unique call to each one of us, I can see God doing incredible things in us and through us. Inefficient? Maybe from a certain vantage point. But foolish? No. The wisdom of God which weaves through all of history and which has been there from the very beginning. Amen.
Well, now is the time where we gather around the, the Lord's table together. So you might want to pause here, and if you can find some bread in your house or a cracker, you can find some grape juice or anything else that you can drink, I would suggest go get them now. Now hear these words of the one who invites you to this table. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come into them and eat with them, and they with me. The psalmist says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find refuge in God. Let us pray. Blessed are you, strong and faithful God. All your works echo the music of your praise. In the beginning, your word summoned light and creation dawned. You gave us breath and speech so that we might join with all creation to sing of your glory. And yet we confess that sin has scarred our world. It has left us scarred. Therefore, we rejoice at this table because of Jesus, your son, our living bread, who healed the sick, offered life to sinners, and with a love stronger than death, opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit upon the cross for our sakes. We rejoice that death could not hold him, and that he is our risen Lord, the Lord over all things. Holy Spirit, be with us, and over these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ, that we may be one with him until his kingdom comes in its full glory. May we be ever watchful in prayer, strong in truth and love, and faithful in our ministry. Amen. And so we remember that the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And so every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's saving death and resurrection until he comes again. So wherever you are in your faith, whether you feel near or far from God, doubtful or sure, these are God's gifts for you so that this good news might be sealed in your hearts. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us partake together. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food for eternal life. May all who are gathered around your table this day be encouraged. May we know your grace, and may our hearts be strengthened for your service. May we, as we seek to be your church and to love as you do, grow in our capacity to love, and in so doing, to catch a glimpse of how great your love is for us. To you, our Savior and Lord, we bring you all of our prayers. For our loved ones and friends that we're thinking about this day, we ask for your presence with them. For those who are suffering around the world, in our neighborhoods and hospitals, we ask for healing and for your providence for them. For those who are trying to plan how we can reopen as counties, states, and countries, we ask that you would give them wisdom. We pray for our community and our nation that is being rocked with economic hardship and hard conversations of how we treat one another. Be with us in them, O oh Lord. May we change for the better. For all the burdens on our hearts, 
Hear our prayers, O Lord. And as we pray, we remember the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as you head into your weeks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>